Um, we, uh, with the, wear your favorite team jersey, I look around the room here, there's only a couple of you I'm worried about, um, but uh, we'll, uh, what's that? You're fine? Okay. Well, I'm, yes, I did look in the mirror. Thank you. Yeah. I always have one in the crowd, you know, and that's good. That's good. Uh, but it is good to have a, a good time. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 13 is where we're going to start this morning. It is good to have a good time and, not, and, you know, in some circles you could never do wear a jersey or a goofball off in the pulpit. You have to be so prim and proper. And uh, I'm, I am so happy and thrilled to report that God does have a sense of humor and he does entertain and like to have a good time. And he does laugh, he does carry on, and he, he uh, at moments is very sarcastic, and that's a good thing. I, I kind of like that part. So anyway, 2 Tim, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, as we uh, introduced last time about some things that Paul requires us to know, and I just kind of did an introduction there, and uh, we're going to... Uh, spend time with that as the broad theme. This morning we're going to bring begin to look at the doctrine of the Godhead. And I'm doing this not that I don't think you understand the Godhead uh, or the Trinity as the theologian, the theology books uh, use it, but rather it's how Paul makes reference to them and how Paul looks at them. Uh, if, if you look here at 2 Corinthians uh, 13 verse 11, Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of, a good, be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All saints salute you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. I think about that, the, that especially verse 14, and how Paul describes the Godhead, how he describes a community, how he describes a lifestyle, how he describes a thinking process, how he looks at it and, and he says in, in, the, in the doxology here to the Corinthians, and he just says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God. And in, a, in a couple weeks, we'll look at the fact that God is love, First John says so. And you think about the love of God. God committed his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. And there's a thought process there that, is to, that uh, we, we, we need to see. There's a, an, a, you think about the communion of the Holy Ghost and how the Holy Ghost is going to commune. And where do we find the communion of the Holy Spirit? Oh, we find it in Scripture because that's his purview. That's where he works. And we'll dig into all of that as we go. Uh, come back to chapter 1, 2 Corinthians 1. I, I just, I, I'm over, uh, there are things that when we talk about Paul and things that Paul requires us to know, and we, we'll get over there in Titus 1 just to hear in a second. But when he does it, he doesn't just say, you should know this and then leave you hanging. He gives information in that that says, oh, you know what, let me go think this through and let me study it out. And that's really what I'd like to do with you over the coming weeks and months and years and moons and all that good stuff. But as we do it, again, we're not going to always just talk about the Godhead. We're going to talk about other things and so forth. But I just, because there's such a, there is a thinking, there is a lifestyle that the Godhead has that you and I are to have. And when we, we are to be God-like, godliness, God-likeness. So if we're, to have, if we're to put on godliness, be God-like, then that means what? We need to understand what God is like. And there's a thought process, and there's a thinking in it, and there's a whole mechanism, and really that's what I'm after, is at the end of the next couple months, as we think about this and as we've looked through it, we can sit here and say, you know what? That's what we ought to be doing. There ought to be a grace. and there, uh, Well, you're in 2 Corinthians 1 now, aren't you? Uh, verse 21. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 21. Now he which established us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. You see the, all three members there. 
You see Christ, who you are in Christ. You see God the Father at work and the, the sealing that he does. And who does he seal you with? The Spirit. You go over there to Ephesians 4 and you got the, the ones, the, the, the endeavoring. Well, I'll just go to Ephesians 4. I put it in the handout there I just so you'd have it. Ephesians 4, verse 3 says endeavoring. Well, just verse 1. Ephesians 4, verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. So we've got a vocation, so we've got a job, and we're going to walk worthy wherewith ye are called with all lowliness and meekness and longsuffering and forbearing one another in love. That whole list in verse 2 is a list of a description of the lifestyle of the Godhead. And how the Godhead lives for one another. And how they live amongst themselves. And how they think about things. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit. Even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. And there's this ultimate relationship that happens. If you come over to Romans 15, where Paul, one more time, lumps the three together. So what do we begin to know? We begin to know that the Godhead is three. You see the three, three persons here. Romans 15 and verse 30. Romans 15, 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and... For the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. And again, all three members are there. So when we begin to think about, now, now come to Titus chapter 1. When we begin to think about the Godhead, and, uh, and by the way, if you want to use the word Trinity, that's fine. It, uh, it's a theology word. It's not really Trinity triune three. The Godhead is, it, the God is one made up of three individual persons, people. And the best way to think about it is, in this room, we are all humanity. We're all human. We have the essence of humanity. But we're not all the same, are we? There's 50 or 60 different personalities and people. Well, that's what God is. They are all God, in essence, deity. But they're three individual members make up the race called God. Okay, And if you can catch that as we go, then you stay out of a lot of superstitious stuff. Titus chapter 1, Paul writes, verse 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after, see that godliness, godlikeness, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. So there's God. Now we're back in eternity past. Before Genesis 1-1, what did God do? God promised. Well, who did he promise? Well, the three members, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, promised together to provide eternal life, to provide a, a redemption plan for fallen humanity. So guess what they knew was coming? Fallen humanity, see? They're, they're, they're not, this isn't so, oh, God is not reactive, see. He's, our, he's proactive. He's already reacted. He's already put into place the considerations and what needs to be done if those considerations are carried out. So there is a, there is a God here that's made up of three individual members, and, and, and there's a unity. Now, what caught my eye was the end of verse 1. When Paul says, according to acknowledging of the truth, which is after what? Godliness. So then there's an issue in godlikeness and godliness that we need to catch and see and understand. So then we have it, <clears throat> excuse me, we have it amongst ourselves. Because when you come, now, now come to 1 Corinthians 12. When you come into the issue of the Godhead and you begin to think about the unity within the Godhead, 1 Corinthians 12, when you begin to think about what's happening within the Godhead itself and how they're interacting, 
then when you run across a, a, a heresy of a doctrine called the doctrine of substan- uh, subordination, okay, when you come across subordination doctrine, which, by the way, what subordination says is that there is a hierarchy within the Godhead. There is not a hierarchy within the Godhead. Nobody, God the Father nor the Holy Spirit, put a gun to the Son's head and said, you're the one dying on the cross. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any grace. See, God is a gracious God across the board. There wouldn't be any liberty, any, any uh, volition. See, so when we, and, and we'll, we'll talk more about that as we go through it, but as we begin to see this, then we can say, hey, wait a minute, that's not exactly right over there, and that is over here. By the way, the biggest way you know there's no subordination, and in, subordin- in the doctrine of subordination, what they say is that the Son has always been and always ever will be subordinate to the Father. Because what did the Son say in the garden? Not my will, but thy will. So see, he's subordinating to the Father, and that is not the case. Because you've got a passage in Philippians 2 that says he humbled himself. That means humble, the humbling was never there before. That means the subjection was never there before. He thought himself to be equal with God. You see, you got verses that just nail this stuff. By the way, you know how they get around it, don't you? Change the verses. And they go in and they say, see, when he says made himself of no reputation, that Greek word is kenosis, and that Greek word means empty. So he empties himself of his deity. And that is a bold-faced heretic. That's heresy. That's a lie from the pit of the devil. He didn't do that. And by the way, your translators understood that the correct translation of kenosis in in the, from Greek into English, was and is reputation because of what is in the context. Because in other places, they do translate that Greek word kenosis to empty and to remove and to other things. So they know how to translate the word. But kenosis in the Greek, it, in the translating, you're allowed to carry the provisions that you can look at the context and make the word fit the context not just a broad statement of empty. So when we have a song that says, and he emptied himself, we don't get our doctrine from songbooks. See. Anyway, that's off base. I got off. That was a rabbit trail. That was a touchdown the other direction. Pick six, going the wrong way. 1 Corinthians 12. You found that now, right? I just want to think, I just kind of get the ball rolling this morning, just thinking about this issue of the Godhead, godliness, godlikeness, and and to begin to see the lifestyle that they have with each other. Verse 4. Now, we're just dumping, we're just diving in here, okay? Paul's dealing with the Corinthians. The Corinthians are in bad shape. They are, uh, they're they're using... uh, uh, hierarchy, they're using the, the sign gifts as the problem, is the issue there. Verse 1, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren. So they've elevated some gifts over other gifts, and, and they're violating the structure. But he says something here in, re, in, in rebuking them, in re, reproving them. Verse 4, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are differences of administrations but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operation, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Now, think about this. Now, Paul here is not trying to prove the the Godhead, that they exist, okay? He's not trying to prove that there are three members of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. See how Scripture, by the way, Scripture doesn't do that. Scripture just says it's a fact. There's God. Now you think about Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God. Not how he came to be, where he came from, who, what makes him. Is he male? Is he female? No, it's just boom, he's there. The fact is God. It's very interesting. God is, what does he say? We got three. We got the Spirit, the same Spirit. We got the same Lord, and we got the same God, the Father. 
Again, God's not a single person, and he's not comprised up of three gods. There's one God that's made up of three separate individuals. They have a life that they enjoy among their ranks. Not one operating independent of the other, but yet they can operate independent as individuals. They're free from each other. They're free from one, yet they are members of the Godhead. They, they come together and they are, they've got jobs to do. And the three members of the Godhead, they, again, they are free from each other. They're going to come and do. The Holy Spirit comes, does, and leaves and does and different things. But they're, but they're going to function in harmony. And Paul here, dealing with the Corinthians and the fact that they are not in unity, see, and because of the Corinthians' lack of unity amongst themselves, Paul brings the Godhead illustration in to, to teach, to show the Corinthians they ought to be functioning together. Notice, that, but now they are diversities of the gifts, but the same spirit. Verse 5, we've got administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but the same God which worketh all. So you've got the Spirit, there's a diversity. You've got the Lord, there's administrations. And then you've got God the Father, and there are operations. And what we'll do is, as we go here is we'll begin to see how these three begin to work in unity, in unison with each other. And you see it right here. The Holy Spirit, He's got a specific work here in the context. Look down at verse 11. But all these worketh that one and selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. The Holy Spirit, in the context, in the, in the spiritual gifts, which is the issue, but the Holy Spirit, he's got the function of diversity, of distribution of the gift. Whatever the gift is, the Spirit is the one divide, giving it out. You, you see that. Diversities of spirit uh, of gifts belongs to who? The Spirit. Okay? So when the Holy Spirit comes in, he's got a specific work as he wills, verse 11. The, 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 the believer that's possessing, the possessor of the gift, the possessing of the gift, say, let's say it that way, is not on the believer. It's on who? The Spirit. Because He's going to give it to who He wills. See? So what that does is that brings off of the believer the issue of trying to seek out the gift. By the way, if you seek a gift, it's not a gift. It's something you're seeking. See? It's off of the believer... It isn't on the believer to try and figure out which gift I'm getting, learn it. It's going to be the Holy Spirit that's going to give it out according to his will. That's why it's men. That's why in chapter 14 there's a whole bunch of rules that have to come into play. So the Holy Spirit is the one giving diversities of gifts. He's, diver, he's given them out as they're going to fit. Now look at the Lord, verse 6. And there are diversities of operations. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. So here's the Lord, here's the Son. He's going to oversee a, the, the administrating of them, the adminning of them, the application of the gift. In other words, he's going to come in and he's going to say, okay, tongues, whoever has the tongue gift, the Spirit's going to give, but that tongue gift, it's going to operate this way. It's going to function this way. He's going to, the administrating of it. Whoever's got the gift of the apostle and the prophet and the teacher and the pastor, those, the, the better gifts in, 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 in later on, he says, okay, this is how they're going to function. So the Holy Spirit is the one empowering the individuals with the gift. The Son, the Lord, comes, takes the gift, and now places it in the proper area of ministry and service. But then he says the operation. 
There's a diversity of operations, but it is the same God. Now think about that. The the Father, God. Operations. Now think about operations. He oversees all of the various areas of activity. He's over here. Okay? The Spirit works, empowers. The Son, this gift is going to work this way. And the Father, He oversees all of the areas of activity. He's responsible for the rule and the organization, all of the activity. The best way I could think about illustrating this is medicine, the field of medicine. If you want to be a doctor or a surgeon, you're going to practice medicine, <laughs> okay? But think about being a doctor. What did, what did they used to do back in the day? If I wanted to be a doctor, I went and worked with a, another doctor. Now, today you got to go to school. So we go to medical school. What does the medical school do? It teaches. The medical school comes in and develops the capacity for them to be the doctor, the surgeon, an EMT. We, I know people who have gone, I'm going to go be a doctor. They, they quit at the nurse level. They don't have the funds to go forward, whatever. That's a great thing. So whatever the, the medical job is, the Holy, that's the Holy Spirit's developing that capacity to be that doctor, nurse, EMT, whatever. The son comes along and he says, okay, you're going to be a doctor. So what am I going to do? Now I'm going to come and take what I learned over here and apply it to the doctor. Think about a surgeon. Uh, a, a friend of mine, he's a hand surgeon. He's back in the East Coast. Actually, he's in Texas now. He's a hand surgeon. Big bucks. He went through medical school, come out, did all his thing, was a general practitioner, was sitting there one day with a patient, and they had a hand problem, and he couldn't get in, so he helped them, et cetera, et cetera. And you know what he did? He went back to school to get the certifications and everything needed to be a what? A hand surgeon. Not a doctor, but a surgeon. So, what is, so the, here's the spirit, the capacity to do, and the son says, okay, you take what you learned and be that hand doctor. Now think about what is, uh, now the father, operations. He, he's the, the son is going to say, okay, you're going to be a doctor. He's going to administrate. He's going to provide the area in which they can perform the capacity of being the doctor. All of this falls under the oversight of the Department of Medicine, the Department of Health. That's the father. What does the Department of Health do? They regulate, don't they? They say, here's the rules, here's the training schedule, here's the information they need to be trained. What did the Father do? He's got a purpose, doesn't he? He says, hey, what am I doing today? I'm forming the church, the body of Christ. It's going to be through salvation alone and grace alone and faith alone and my son's shed blood. And then it's going to be through the information I'm going to have revealed over here to the Apostle Paul. You see, the Father comes in, and he is the overall oversider, seer. He's providing the guidelines for training, and and actually he's writing the training manual. Your manual is written by God the Father, but it's also the work product of who? The Holy Spirit, because it provides the capacity. Do you guys follow that? My point in in 1 Corinthians 12 is the Godhead is working in unity with each other. The Spirit does his role, the Son does his role, and the Father is going to do his role. Now, look, go back there, look at chapter 12, look at verse 6, and just think about the way verse 6 ends. Worketh all in all. Now, think about that. We see the Godhead working this way. The Father working, come over to Ephesians 1. 
the Father working, then the Son working, and the Holy Spirit working. And they're all doing, and the Son doesn't go, well, wait a minute, I want to do what the Spirit wants to, is doing. And the, the Spirit doesn't say, I'm doggone it, I, that Son looks like he's doing something better, and I want to do, he's not, none of that. See, they understand the Father's program. They understand the plan. Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1. So here's the Father, the operation of God. And what he has to, and that what that has to do with is the overall fulfilling of his wise master plan and purpose. 111. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. How's the Father work? He's working after the counsel of his own will, his good pleasure. What's the counsel of his own will? Verse 9 and 10. The Father's will has been revealed. Verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the ages, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. What is his will? By the way, the he here, verse 3, is the Father, the God and the Father of our Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Father has a will, he's got a purpose, and everything that's working within the Godhead, and then subsequently down on the earth through the nation of Israel, and you and I through the church, the body of Christ, and the heavenly places is all according to his purpose. Whose purpose? The Father's purpose. The operations. Here's the oversee. Here's how things are going to function. Come over to chapter 3 of Ephesians. Chapter 3, verse 9. What I want you to grasp, catch this morning is these guys, they, they working together. And they're working together in a unity with a unified goal. And the goal is the fulfilling of the, of the purpose and the plan of God. He is the father of, all, of glory. He's the one that gives life to the plan, life to the issues. Uh, chapter 3, verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who, hath cre who created all things by Jesus Christ. Wow. There's his purpose. That now, to the intent that now, under principalities and powers and heavenly places, he might be, might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. What's the Father's purpose? Ephesians 1.10, I'm going to go back to Ephesians 1. I'm going to do this through my, with my son. I have a plan. I have a purpose, and it's vested in my son. And I know that my son will gladly, willingly choose to come and participate in it. I know the spirit will do, come, and willing. Part so this is what we're doing. And then they come up, and then they go work together. Chapter 1, verse 23, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. It has to do with the accomplishment of his, own, of his overall purpose and plan. And what we do is we find the Father is the one who is all in all. He, it's, he crafted the plan and the purpose. He developed it. He gave life to that plan. He's the father of glory. And it's vested in his son. So when you begin to think about the Godhead, and you begin to think about the three in one, again, God's not, an, it's not a, he's not an individual. Rather, he's God, a community made up of three individuals who also carry that essence of deity. Now, come, come back there. Again, come back to Acts 17. In Scripture, it doesn't explain how God came about, where he came from. He's 
everlasting to everlasting. He's just there. Again, in the beginning, God created. He's just there. He's it. That's not the point in Scripture, by the way. What would be the point in Scripture? Here's the, here's the purpose and the plan of the Father for the earth and for the heaven. And let's get on with it. Okay. Acts 17. When you think about the word Trinity, just by the way, Trinity, three, triune, okay? So it, it, you want to use Trinity, you can. The Bible word is, the, is Godhead. Acts 17, look at verse 29. Paul dealing here on Mars Hill. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. Three times the word Godhead shows up in your King James Bible. There's one, Colossians 2, verse number 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and then come over to Romans 1. Romans 1, verse 20. And it's interesting that the Godhead, that, that, that term, is only used by Paul. In the Old Testament, it's God. Or Lord God, Jehovah God, Jehovah the Father, Jehovah the Son, or Jehovah the Holy Spirit. What Jehovah is his name in the Old Testament, but he's God. The Lord, we're not going to run the verses, Deuteronomy, the, uh, Genesis 11. Well, we may go back to Genesis 11, but Deuteronomy says, the Lord uh, are one. You know, God is one. See, they, they, never tr they never had a fight over how many gods there were or what this or that. Only us dumb thump Gentiles do that. Okay? Look at Romans 1 and look at verse 20. Because, again, Paul uses it here. And you have to think about this word Godhead for just a moment. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So when you think about the word Godhead, deity, God, Godhead, well, God, deity, the, okay? But then that word head. Now, head, I, I, I go copy out of the etymology dictionary about Godhead. Okay, so I'm just going to read you what, they, what you know, these guys say, and then I need you to kind of think about this. So, circa 1200, divine nature, deity, divinity from God, plus the Middle English head, along with maidenhead, the sole survivor of this form of the suffix, Old English has God had, H-A-D, divine nature parallel with Godhood, it's from the 13th century, now chiefly restricted to state or condition of being a god. Did that help you? Not at all, did it? We understand what God is, right? Deity, okay? But think about the word head and how, where that comes from. The, head, the word head, H-E-A-D, it, it, it's Middle English, okay? And what it, what it defines, what it means is, is the state or condition of being. So think about hood, Godhood. Now, they, the Bible doesn't use hood, it uses head. But think about the, 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 the off, uh, off of the word head, a variant is the word hood. Now, the word hood, H-O-O-D, that, that word forming element meaning state or condition of being, as in childhood. Priesthood, manhood, adulthood. So what are we talking about? We're talking about, think about sisterhood. Think about brotherhood, childhood, adulthood, manhood. What are we doing here? We're referring to a class of individuals of the same kind. When we say childhood, there's a number of what? Children. See? But what are they? They're all children, age-wise. They're not 20-year-old children, even though 20-year-olds sometimes act like children. So adulthood, all of the same class, adults. So when you think about the Godhead, Godhead is a, is a, is, is a plural type of a noun, plural, plural. 
the, it's a number of individuals that are of the same class and kind of deity. How many are there? Three. There's three individuals. Come over with me to 1 John chapter 5. There are three individuals that make up deity, God. So Godhead is a beautiful word. It's a beautiful term. It's the proper term. And, and actually what it does is it begins to cause us to look a little deeper than the word trinity. Because when you say trinity, you just think the three and off you go. But when you think about Godhead, hood, now we're, now we're going a little deeper. Now we're going to produce, that produces a concept of community. Because if the childhood is a number of the children, all the same that are children, there is now a community. The nursery children play a certain way. There's community there. So when we begin to think about the Godhead, or Godhood, if you want to use it that way, it produces a concept of community. There is a unity of purpose among the three. There is a lifestyle, a community among the three. There's a way of life that they're going to live and act and interact with one another. And in that lifestyle, you're in, I told you, 1 John 5, right? Okay, if you look there at uh, 1 John 1, well, just go to 5. We'll, we'll stay on track, okay? And we'll pick this up next time. When you think about the community, they don't live independent of each other, even though they are independent of each other. They're living for the other. They are free from each other. They're, they're not tied where, well, one thinks it and then everybody does it. They, are, they do live individually, but yet they are living for each other. And that's a wonderful relationship that you and I are to have with one another. We are independent. When I say amen, everybody in this room is going to break, huddle up, gone. You're going to go to lunch. You're going to go family. You're going to do whatever you're going to do. You're going to sit. You're going to not watch the Super Bowl. Who care less about Taylor Swift. You Swifties, okay. Yeah, I, ooh, okay. You don't care about that. You're going to, or, or all you're going to do is watch the commercials. So during the football game, you're going to go to the bathroom, eat, party, hardy. And in commercials, you're going to stop and you're going to watch. Whatever you do, what are we? We're all individuals, aren't we? Linda and I were talking about maybe having folks over, and I go, why? Because <laughs> I don't like some of that. And, I, you know, and, you know, it's not that I don't like you guys, but it's just, you know, you, you get distracted. So, the, so don't come over, okay? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Now you're going to all show up. I'm, I'm going to go to the steakhouse. <laughs> you guys, sure, go ahead. Uh, the key's under the mat. Help yourself. Just don't let the dog out, would you? Or maybe. I don't know. That might be a good thing. My point is, is when you're talking about the, the Godhead, there's a way of life. There's a divine lifestyle, a community that's being expressed in Scripture in a very specific way. They don't live independent of each other. They live for each other. They are independent, but they've chosen to live for the other. And the Godhead enjoys this type of dependency, if you will, with each other and for each other. And again, they are free from each other. Don't ever think they're not. But what have they chosen to do? Live for each other. 1 John 5, verse 7. We've got a few minutes here. 1 John 5, verse 7 and 8 are, the, uh, are what is called the Johnine comma. And, and what the New Bibles do is they say this, doesn't, this passage is not found in the oldest text, which is a lie because it is there. And they rip it out because it defines and defends the Godhead. Verse 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. How many are in heaven? How many make up God? Three. By the way, the Father, the Word. The Word is the Son's original name. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 of John 1, And the Word was made 
flesh. Jesus Christ is his flesh. Jesus is his human name. Prior to him becoming humanity, he was what? The Word. See? So you, that's a point of clarification. They are one. Clearly, right? The Father, the Word, the Son, the Spirit. Clearly. One. Now look at verse 8. And there are three that bear record, that bear witness in earth. The Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. Isn't that interesting? They're not one. They what? Agree in one. A little different, isn't it? See? But what do we have? We have they agree in one. Verse 7, they, they, the three are one. One, plural. Okay? Now, not to bore you with a bunch of English, because as soon as I get started in English, then the English teachers speak up, and then I look like I don't know what I'm talking about, so I usually don't try to talk about English. The plural now. Not one individually, but rather one in relationship. They are unique individuals, independent individuals, yet one in essence, in purpose. They're one in harmony. Come back with me to Genesis 11. Let me show you. We understand this. How many states make up the United States? 50. Well, 55 if you count like the other side counts. 50. Okay? Some of you got that. That's okay. 50 states. But we say the 50 states are what? One nation under God. 50 individual states. But yet we call them what? One nation. One, three individual members of God, but yet we call them God. Genesis 11. Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel here. We'll, we'll spend some time in the future looking at this passage. Genesis 11, verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower. You see the us? Man, it's man talking. Okay? But in verse 3, they said one to another, but then there's an us. Now watch verse 5. And the Lord, and by the way, capital L-O-R-D, Jehovah, <coughs> came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they began to do, and now, and now nothing will be restrained from, with, from them which they have imagined to do. Now watch verse 7. Go to let us go down. Wait a second. Who's speaking? Lord, Jehovah. Then he says what? Us. So who is the Lord, Jehovah, representing? The three members of the Godhead. So there's Jehovah, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The th let us go down. And there and confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. You, do you see that? He says, Lord, and then he says, us. So what's the one? The Lord. One, it, not, it, it's the three individuals making up the one essence of Jehovah. You follow that? Okay? Now, come over to Genesis 1. Because that is how this is used in Scripture. Genesis 1, look at verse 24. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing out in the beasts of, of the earth after his kind, and it was so. Verse 6, 26. And God said, Let us... See, God said, Let us... God, the title, us, the three members that make up the title... God said, let us make man in our image. See, our image. After our likeness, 
Let us, let, you know, verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. What do we have? Man is a three-part component, aren't we? A soul, a spirit, and a body. What are we mimicking? What, are we, we, what is imagery being put? How the Godhead is made. Come over to chapter 2. Chapter 2. Look at verse 22. 222. And the rib which the Lord God, now you see the Lord God, capital L-O-R-D, then capital G, little O-D, that's Jehovah the Son. Your translators did it that way so that you would understand that in the Hebrew of Elohim and uh, that's who we're talking about is Jehovah the Son. So they did it that way. So if you see capital L, little O-R-D, capital G-O-D, that's Jehovah the Father. Okay, And they do that so you can understand in English who's talking here and who's doing. So here we have God the Son. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken what, out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and they shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be, what? One flesh. Wait a minute. We got two fleshies, male and female, and they're going to come together and be what? One. Two distinct individuals coming together and making a new family unit, a new marriage unit. But what are we? So we understand what the one thing is. We, we, I, I hope we do. Now come to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. So in Scripture, 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. How many gods? Just one. But there's a one mediator too, isn't there? The mediator is Jesus Christ. But also, who's involved in this activity of your redemption? The Holy Spirit, because Ephesians 1.13 says you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So what we will see as we go through is we will see all three members partake in the conception and the birth of Christ. They take part in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and therefore they take part in you completely. And we'll walk through those components, okay? Acts 17. Acts 17. Just one more on this issue of the one. And I think we've beat, beat the dead horse in that issue. The reason I go through this is because when we begin to bring up some of the doctrines that float around out there, they are moving away from this three make up the one. And they make the Godhead actually three gods, therefore making the Son and the Spirit lesser gods. And it just, they convolute it off. Or they will say, there's only one God, and in the Old Testament, you see the Father at attribute. And then in the Gospels and the Acts, you see the Son's attribute. And then over here in Acts, you see the Spirit's attribute. And then I go, well, what about us? Well, we're just, sorry, Charlie, you're out. See, they break it up. Acts 17, verse 24. Again, Mars Hill, Paul says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in the temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needeth anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitations, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. When you cut yourself, what color blood do you bleed? Red. Everybody does. I blue, I, I bleed blue. I bleed crimson. <laughs> Roll tide. Okay? No, you bleed. 
Everybody's that way. That's why, what is it, uh, the blood type? O is a universal. I think it's O. Why? Because everybody can use it. So how did God make man? Made one with two components. But when you begin to look at across the nations, we're all a little different, but we're still all what? Human. Humanity. So as we begin to look here at the doctrine of the Godhead, we have one God made up of three individuals who collectively are called the Godhead. Three specific individuals. They have a lifestyle. They have a community. They have a unity that we need to understand and then therefore that we can then enjoy. And we can have it now, right here on planet Earth in our life. And we can take it and we can bring it in and we can say, you know what? How would God think about this this way? And let's go that way. We already have the mind of Christ, but guess what we also have? the mind of God, the Godhead. We have that. I think Paul requires us to know this, not just in a passing glance, but in the details of the verses, because of what he is going to say, like in the Philippians 2 passage and other places about the deity. Okay? I think it's important. I think we look at it. We'll spend a few couple months on this. Okay? All right, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word and for the look into you and to look into the relationship and to the family that you have there amongst yourselves, the, the community. And Lord, I pray that we would catch it, we would see it, and therefore then bring it into our lives so we can enjoy it as well now as we will enjoy it one day out in the ages to come. And we can enjoy it here now in this moment in our lives as we go day by day. In your name we pray, amen. All right.